Hello, everyone. This is Manolo Concepcion. I am the new associate head coach at Eastern Illinois University here in the United States of America, part of the NCAA Division I. I am born and raised in Puerto Rico um, and started this type of podcast or educational journey uh, back in March when this pandemic uh, began and uh, wanted to create an opportunity for everyone um, to stay connected uh, within, within the game that we love um, by bringing people from different volleyball communities and uh, trying to share different uh, backgrounds and experiences. So here we are today with another great guest, uh, someone that is responsible for not just spreading the game that we love, but also being a pioneer, an innovator, a scientist within the game that we all love. Mr. Dr. Doug Beal. <laughs> How are you, sir? I'm great, Manolo. Thank you very much. That's that's a, a wonderful uh, introduction of all the uh, images of the, the terrific uh, people that you've had. My gosh, this is uh, something special you're putting together on, on a worldwide basis. I, I congratulate you. And uh, boy, during this terrible time, it's, uh, it's great to see the creativity and uh, I don't know, the ability of our populations to connect and and stay eager to learn and share ideas so w wonderful to be here and uh and, and i applaud you for what you're doing thank you so much for that and let me tell you first of all that you are and have been an inspiration of me personally um you and your good pal um dr car mcgown rest in peace so for me this is an honor um, to have one of my idols of the game here with me today um, and basically having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I appreciate everyone that is watching around the world. Uh, gracias a todos los que están escuchando alrededor del mundo. Por favor, eh, manténgase pendiente a toda la información que vamos a estar brindando. Uh, Doug, first of all, I want to ask, how are you and your family uh, going through this crisis and pandemic? Um, is everyone safe and healthy? And what are some things then that you are being occupying your time with? Uh, we are, and and I appreciate asking, and, and I hope the same for you and your family. Um, you know, my wife and I were uh, very fortunate that both our children were able to get home uh, mm -hmm. and spend quite a bit of time with us. Uh, they're not here this minute, but uh, they're off starting their own uh, uh, careers. But for uh, almost two months they were here, it was really wonderful for us to uh, be able to share some adult time, I guess, when they're not just growing up, but they're, <laughs> they're already grown up. Uh, so we're safe. Uh, they're all healthy, uh, thank goodness. And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to... Um, use the time as best we can. Uh, I'm, I'm doing some, uh, cer certainly a little bit of work in the volleyball space, but uh, also in the Olympic world, I'm, I'm helping uh, one of the uh, other national governing bodies to uh, maybe make some positive changes in, in organization and, and uh, administration and programming. I'm, I'm helping with uh, USA Surfing, yes. tr trying and to stay I'm connected. I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah. I'm excited about talking about that matter. I really want to give, uh, you know, individual attention to that matter because I, it's a really important work that you're doing right now sure. um, with that element. And I want to ask you, like, how does Mr. Volleyball, you know, goes into the surfing world? Have you ever <laughs> surfed in your life? Uh, maybe once, maybe <laughs> one time, yeah. Many, many years ago. Uh, yeah, it, it, it certainly was not because of my, my expertise in the sport. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is a really difficult time for certainly for everybody, uh, mm -hmm. but also for the, the small sports, the, uh, the new sports. Uh, surfing is going to debut at the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games uh, next summer. Mm -hmm. And so it's a new national governing body here in the United States. Um, but I think it's, um, it's one of the sports that is really fits exactly with what the International Olympic Committee, the broadcasters, and, and really the Olympic world broadly is looking for. They're trying to add some sports that are action-oriented, lifestyle-oriented, appeal to uh, the emerging populations, newer, younger audiences, 
So I think it's I think it's going to be a terrific addition to the Olympic uh, menu, the, the the calendar. Uh, some of the most accomplished surfers in the world, world champions, are, are already qualified from the United States and other countries. Uh, so I'm I'm really pleased to stay involved with the Olympic movement and Olympism broadly. I, I'm 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 quite passionate about that. I. Um, uh, the, the years that I was uh, CEO at USA Volleyball, I think I got probably probably more of an education than I thought I would on governance and operations and strategic planning and and really uh, trying to help to create a, a stable organization that that can function uh, sort of under any environment. And we're certainly testing that right now because boy, the uh, the challenges Sorry. for the for the U.S. Uh, Olympic and Paralympic Committee, for the IOC itself, all of the National Olympic Committees around the world is is just uh, a, a really, really challenging moment now. And the sports are dealing with uh, the unknown and uncertainty of when events can happen again, under what conditions, what, what are the revenue streams, uh, how do we qualify athletes? It's just a, a terrible unknown in addition to the terrible health um, challenges that we're all uh, facing. At that level, um, uh, are you con already considering as a group that this might go beyond 2020 and, you know, and putting uh, put 2021 Olympics in jeopardy? Like, what are the projections right now? You know, I, I honestly, I hate to guess about that, uh, Manolo. I think it's mm -hmm. uh, it, it was clearly impossible to hold the games this summer. Yeah. Um, they would have started in a couple of weeks. Um, travel restrictions, health concerns, uh, packing a lot of people in, in a small environment. Um, so it was impossible. There, there was really no choice. Um, mm -hmm. I'm... I, I am, and I and I want to be very optimistic that the games can be held uh, next year, about a year from now, a little little more than a year from now. Um, but there are are going to be enormous difficulties and challenges, and and probably the the surest way that we'll know that the games are on is that we will have a widely available, very effective vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and that's certainly. <laughs> Uh, long out of my hands, but absolutely. Uh, but there are so many really smart research labs, smart people who are working uh, around the world, and I just, I just have to be optimistic. There, there are so many um, brilliant people, scientists who are working on this at a, at a pace I think that perhaps is unusual. Uh, so I want to be optimistic, and even, you know, even under the best of conditions, the <clears throat> the Tokyo. Olympics gets to be held. We have uh, a winter games following six months mm -hmm. later in, in China. And then two years after that, <clears throat> less than two years, really a year and a half, the, uh, the next Olympics, uh, uh, in, in Paris, it's, mm. it's going to be a lot of events, a lot of sports trying to recover what they may have lost in <laughs> opportunities, let alone revenue, but really opportunities for so many uh, athletes to play, trying to be condensed into a much, much shorter time frame. So it's going to be a challenging couple of years at the very least, I think, for the world of sports as well as everybody else. And uh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And I, and I hope everyone, you know, it's, uh, it's out there safe and healthy. Um, we're gonna, we just can, you know, worry about the things that we can control right now, do the best we can with what we have. Um, so again, I appreciate everyone that, that is tuning in. Um, again, this is Doc Beal, um, the legendary player, coach, CEO, and now involved with USA Surfing. Um, but let's start, let's start from the beginning. Um, you play more than 200 matches as a player for Team USA, and of course, also a Hall of Fame player at the Ohio State University. Um, tell me a little bit about that period of time, and what were some, you know, what, what were some good times and some challenges that uh, that you faced during that time? You know, the uh, <clears throat> the question I get a lot is, uh, do I miss coaching or do I miss being CEO? And and my, <laughs> My, my normal answer is, 
I, I do. I miss everything, but mostly I miss being a player. Uh, mm. And so many of us, uh, with some obvious exceptions, but so many of us started our uh, our life, I guess, in in volleyball and and a lot of sports because we fell in love with playing the game, and there was something magical about it, and something that connected, and and we enjoyed the 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 group uh, relationships, the social uh, interaction, the challenge of 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 how to play this sport where you have to rotate around with some unique <laughs> characteristics that uh, are, are kind of different than other sports. And so, gosh, for me, uh, I was able to start at a pretty young age because uh, I just happened to be in the right place at the right school with the right teachers who introduced the sport to me. And, and it just, we connected uh, and I loved it. And, um, I played a lot of sports like so many people growing up. Um, I, I, I loved sports. and uh, But the opportunities that volleyball presented have just been, um, I don't know, hard for me to really, really understand and come to grips with sometimes. Um, but playing on the U.S. national team uh, is just always special. And uh, I had a coach one time that lined us up and, and asked us um, just before a, a, a practice, you know, do, do you know how many people there are in the United States? And do you know how many people there are who play this sport around the world? And do you know how many people get to be on this national team? And, you know, it, it, you don't think about those things mostly because you're young and you're energetic and, <laughs> you know, you don't have a whole lot of experience being, uh, I don't know, a deep thinker about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But, mm -hmm. um, Boy, that resonated with me, and I think with a lot of my teammates. And uh, it's just, it's just special. And I, I, I honestly, I, I pinch myself a lot of times that uh, I, I've had some fortunate experiences. But playing for the U.S., traveling around the world, getting to do what you love to do, and not really thinking of it in in a in a career sense or an occupation sense. It's just I love to play this game and. I, I really enjoy hearing that when I read about other athletes and well, how passionate they are. And you wouldn't have to pay me a dime. I'd do the same thing. And I think, I don't know, we're pretty lucky to be able to do that. And yes, it's morphed into being a world of entertainment and we have to compete for attention and get TV eyes, eyeballs on you and fill up stands and Hmm. try to attract sponsors. And I, I get all that and I, I've operated in that world uh, for quite a while, but boy, the, the passion and excitement of just seeing kids who love to play and accomplish something that they couldn't do yesterday, that they're doing a little bit better today is absolutely, maybe, maybe that's what sports is all about. I agree. I agree. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that also, bind us that join us you know that that allow us to for example in these difficult times to for us to be on the same page about something you know Absolutely. um so i think it's something that we all appreciate um question doug and during those playing times when was the moment that you started thinking about you know moving into the coaching world um and then who were responsible you know for that influence in you uh yeah. on your first uh coaching years you know uh, um i've thought about that a bunch uh, over the years during the years that i was a player a lot of players acted as coaches. There wasn't really a very structured profession, let's call it, of coaching. And mm -hmm. if you were a, a pretty good player, um, you were many times tasked with organizing the team, making sure you had enough players to show up to the tournament on the weekend, making sure <laughs> people got to the practice. Maybe even you had to design the practice because it was just a group of players. Nobody was really the coach many times. Mm -hmm. There were some coaches, um, you know, Val Keller and Harlan Cohen and, and Al Skates and Jim Coleman and uh, mm -hmm. Don Shondell. And I, I'm thinking of the names off the top of my head who really 
started, I think, the profession of coaching in the United States. And I, I, I keep saying this, I consider myself incredibly fortunate because I've had the opportunity to interact and learn and experience from all of those names that I mentioned. Mm. But so that's, I guess, what started me coaching. And when I went on the very first uh, national team trip that I went to, which happened to be the world championships uh, in 1970 in Bulgaria, I, I just started writing things. What did I see? Mm. We, we got to go to watch other teams practice. And at that time, the country called Czechoslovakia, it's now the Czech Republic and Slovakia, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the best teams in the world. We were in that pool. And we got to go and watch them play. I'll bet you we weren't there for 30 minutes maybe. And I just was, I don't know, stunned, I think, is probably not, not, not incorrect to say I was stunned by how talented they were and I remember watching them do a six on six drill and they were probably not playing as hard as they possibly could, <laughs> but the ball would stay in play across the net hmm. six or eight times repeatedly. And I remember hmm. the teams that I was playing on, whether it was a club team or the national team. Or that didn't happen. Team, <laughs> never, never. I mean, we were lucky if we could, you know, rally the ball three times across the net. And so we would, I don't know, that really impressed me. And the control that the players had was a level above what I was used to. Hmm. So I don't know that I can't say that that really, you know, was the start, but those kinds of experiences re really impacted me. You are responsible, and, and let me let me put it this way. You know, I for the past couple of months, I have been interviewing people from around the world, and many people from different countries have said that you're responsible or one of the people responsible for impacting their country in what they do right now. Um, and that was since the 80s. Um, tell, me, tell me about your, you know, your, you putting motor learning principles into the game that we love. You know, you and Dr. Carl McGowan. And tell me about this mission, about going maybe around the world, maybe around USA, um, and trying to sell this idea of bringing science into the game. Yeah, first of all, it's, uh, it's always wonderful to hear those kinds of stories, and I appreciate that. And uh, I've been able to speak in a lot of different places. I, I love, really love talking to coaches and, and not just in a formal setting, but uh, informally, socially, and, and sharing thoughts and watching what other coaches do. And I, I think coaching is a profession that you just, um, uh, you sort of gather things that you've seen and, and take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you know, how does, how does this fit with my personality and the team I happen to have, et cetera, anyway. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so it's nice to hear those things. And it, it, it's been fun for me to, to go to lots of places around the world and, and, and learn. Doug, and I'm talk. talking about from Argentina, Puerto Rico, yeah. Spain, Italy, you know, people from different countries, different continents saying the same yeah. story. Maybe they read it someplace. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's very nice, and I and I appreciate that. You know, I think um, uh, one thing that always um, I think uh, stands out in, in my background is so I studied motor learning as a minor part of my uh, degree at, at Ohio State when I was working on a graduate degree, and so I had a a, a little bit of a background, and then um, I had the opportunity to interact a lot with uh, Jim Coleman and Carl McGowan. Mm -hmm. um, and Carl was more structured and Jim was more uh, empirical, I guess. Um, <laughs> so he saw things <clears throat> and, and, he, and he picked out what he liked and, and it happened to be a lot of the same things that Carl put a nice structure to. Mm -hmm. um, and so they both had a significant influence on me. And, uh, um, you know, the, the really simple phrase that the game teaches the game um, 
I, I'm not sure that I ever used that phrase until I heard somebody else use it. But I understood that you have to play in a competitive environment. Uh, you have to try to achieve some objective in a in an environment that is as close as you can possibly get to the game itself. And, and I was always struck when I would talk to coaches in other sports, how they tried to simulate the environment that they were going to play in on that Friday night or Saturday or whatever, whatever it was, whether it was basketball, football, soccer, whatever. And so I guess from the time I started, um, I favored uh, trying to train whatever team I had with something like a game, game like situations. So now we talk about that, um, you know, that there isn't very much transfer if we're not doing things close to the way they actually happen in a game. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm delighted if there are people who think I've helped um, sort of promote that concept in, in how we develop the sport right now. And, no, and definitely. And I, and I think people even talk about, you know, how they build their own their own um, teaching methods within the principles. Principles are few, you know, methods are there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, yeah. But I want to ask you, where do you stand right now in terms of block versus training compared to 1980s? Um, and what have you learned about about this right now? Yeah, <laughs> too many things to talk about in this, in this <laughs> hour, probably. Um, first, first of all, I think um, coaching and the sport has been dramatically impacted by a couple of, of things. One is the evolution of the profession of coaching. And mm -hmm. so very few of us back in the late 60s and 70s and even into the 80s Uh, really had the opportunity to study coaching as a science mm -hmm. and apply, whether it's motor learning or physiology or biomechanics or whatever, statistics to the game. And so um, the fact that whether it's because of Title IX or the growth of the sport at the junior club level or all, all kinds of different things, we have a, a, a remarkable coaching profession in at least in the United States, but I think in many other places around the world that didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. And that leads to tremendous knowledge, tremendous sophistication, tremendous advances in all kinds of areas that impact player performance, player health, player nutrition, longevity of careers, you name it. Um, secondly, uh, and I already mentioned it, so Title IX has had a huge impact on our sport and really not just for women, but mm -hmm. for the sport broadly. Hmm. And the fact that we've, we, we are now the most popular sport for girls and women in high school and college is enormously influential and impactful in, again, influencing the time that's available to study the sport, to expand the knowledge, to bring science, to bring coaching education to the sport of volleyball that didn't, again, didn't exist in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. And then I guess I want to point to two other things. The fact that so many U.S. players, um, just as one example, are playing all over the world and seeing the sport how it's promoted, how it's marketed on television, how the sponsors deal with it uh, in almost every country, in Europe, in South America, in Asia, in the, the Middle East, you, you, know, you, you can hardly find a place that doesn't have some kind of league slash professional league. So that's mm -hmm. been enormously impactful and has advanced the sport. And so it's, you know, and then of course we have all the rule changes. <laughs> Uh, the, the way the game is played today, the speed, the power, the physicality of the men and women who are playing the game is just at a, I don't know, at, at two or three standard deviations above where it was mm -hmm. back, back in the 70s. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it's, it's it's not just a different world. It's a remarkably different world. When Team USA started with this 
scientific project um, that you were in charge of as a coach, um, what was your proposal? Um, and then, you know, you stay, you know, in different roles until recently um, in USA Volleyball. So what were you trying to sell USA Volleyball that, of course, has worked and has become, you know, this global figure that, that is always almost in the top of the world? So one of the things I think that's been uh, maybe a little bit overlooked but is is critically impactful for volleyball was creating a training center, uh, mm. creating an opportunity for the players and the coaches to work, to be paid full time, uh, to be together. Uh, when I when I was playing on the national team most of the years, um, a, a new team was selected every summer, uh, <laughs> usually from the national championships. And so if you were on the national team in year one, no guarantee you were going to be on the national team in <laughs> wow. year two. You had to try yeah. out again. You, you know, you had to go through the process. And so frequently. So like no continuity, no long-term development type of deal. Al almost none. And certainly, okay. certainly the best players, if they could afford it and were, were able to be available, were likely to be selected year after year. But maybe the turnover was much greater than it would be today. Mm -hmm. And there was no year round concept of how we can impact th these players. Uh, we didn't know who the coach was going to be from year one to year two. Um, mm -hmm. And the number of matches that the teams played, I, I think some of the years that I played on the national team, maybe we played seven international matches, one, mm -hmm. one competition. We might've trained for two and a half months. Uh, to go to one competition to play seven <laughs> matches. So creating a that training center. drastically. <laughs> yeah, things are, things are different. So creating a, a, a training center that was specific to volleyball. And some of those years, we actually used the U.S. Olympic Training Center, mm -hmm. um, both men and women. But fundamentally, we decided, USA Volleyball, the United States Volleyball Association at that time, decided if we really are serious, if we're going to be good and compete with the best teams in the world who are already doing this, we're going to have to play a lot more, train a lot more hours, have continuity, support mm -hmm. the team. And I think I was uh, one of the people who pushed that message. But I give a lot of credit to the leaders of USA Volleyball you know, names that most people aren't even going to remember here, Wilbur Peck, Bill Baird, but Al Monaco was incredibly important here. Uh, Cliff McPeak, you know, because that was hard to do at that time and it was mm -hmm. expensive and it was a big percentage of the revenue and the, and the income that USA volleyball had. Um, and, and, you know, volleyball is still, I think, competing in a, in a sense to be commercially viable. You know, it's not easy to put a big crowd in the stands. It works at Nebraska and it works at the University of Hawaii, Hawaii and a few other places, but it doesn't work everywhere. And we're still hopefully moving in the right direction to make this sport really a spectator sport, an attractive spectator sport. So it wasn't easy to to create these national training centers. And I think that's one of the most significant things. And uh, that USA Volleyball has done for men and women. Mm. And every time we've gone from one location to another, we've made progress. We've made a better training center, more resources, more amenities, more support for the athletes, for the coaches, and it's just gotten better and better. And I think having the, the teams together now in uh, Anaheim, California, has just been fantastic. Doug? What does this picture mean to you? Like, can you take me to this moment, um, this year um, of your career? Yeah, this looks, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is in Los Angeles in, uh, in 84 or close. Yes, it must be. yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't, I can't remember if I wore that jacket in the gold medal match. That might not be the gold medal <laughs> match, but, uh, but it was uh, in Los Angeles. Yeah, the, the Los Angeles games were, uh, kind of a dream come true, you know, pack crowds every night playing at home. Um, the team uh, had been peaking, I think, and uh, 
You know, I'm, so I'm you expected proud. that result, uh, Doug, when you got in, you know, when you went into the Olympics, did you expected your team to play as well as it did? Uh, yes, I expected the team to play really well. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that we ever want to say at that time in 1984, first time in the Olympic Games for a men's team since 1968. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I want to say, yeah, we, we were incredibly confident we could win. Play mm -hmm. well? Absolutely. We had, we had won, I, I can't remember the exact number, Manolo, but I think we had won 27 or 30 matches in a row mm -hmm. leading up to that, including uh, winning uh, four matches against the Soviet team uh, about a month and a half before the games, winning a tournament in the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia at the time, beating Poland, beating Bulgaria, beating a bunch of the teams that ultimately boycotted the games. So, yeah, we very much knew we had a really good team, uh, that we had played at a high level for a long period of time. And um, so we were not surprised that uh, that we were good. To win, I don't know that we ever say, yeah, we're going to win, but we certainly thought we had a chance to be a medal team and maybe win the gold medal. Your principles are obvious. You know, it's what Team USA and USA Volleyball represents, basically. But how about your coaching philosophy? If you can define it, if I'm in your team, you know, how do you first start selling your vision and what you know what what is that vision in general yeah that's a complicated question Manola. uh <laughs> i think everybody everybody talks about their philosophy in i think very different ways uh even mm -hmm. people whose philosophy is um <clears throat> is probably very similar um <laughs> you know i uh i believe less is more Uh, I, I don't think coaches should spend a whole lot of time talking uh, to try to convince their players how smart they are. Um, I think you convince them by what you do and mm -hmm. how you interact with uh, people, uh, largely one-on-one, -on -one, but also as a group. Mm -hmm. I think one of, the, one of the jobs of a coach, especially at an elite level, is to um, show people uh, what's possible. Uh, that you can do these things. But I also think it's important to um, pay attention to what players can do. Some of the things that we did um, were because we were perceptive enough or, or sensitive enough or smart enough to watch our players and, mm -hmm. and to see when they were, um, I, I, I hesitate to use the word fooling around, but, but kind of warming up before and after practices or, Just um, we observed them in between drills and, uh, you know, they would hit out of the back row and they would hit different quick sets and they would hit different sets with different speeds. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, players are pretty creative and players learn from each other. And modeling is a is a really critical part of of of, of growth in in technical ability and, and in uh, skill development. And um, mm -hmm. I think we did a pretty good job of figuring that out. And I, th I think uh, not being afraid to fail, um, believing that there is a better way uh, to play the game, uh, there's a better mm -hmm. system. Uh, lots of the things that we wanted to develop with that team were built around who, who's at the top of the world. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how are they playing? What's unique about the way they play? What should be able to work? How do we compete with that system, that team? We have to do some things that cause problems for them. Can those things be things that our team has uh, got the personnel to do, that we have enough training time to get good at? Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, we had a huge advantage to uh, 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 an amazing advantage. So we were qualified to go to the Olympics in 1984. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go and, and <laughs> you know, and, and we get to do, we get to do some things that might've been more challenging if we'd have had to qualify. And I, I've said this many, many, many times for most of the countries in the world, most of the teams, 
qualifying to get to the games is much more difficult than achieving some result at the games. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's some regions that yeah. maybe those specific teams, because of those specific regions, will never make it to the Olympics and they could probably do it in, you know, in a different part of the world. Yeah, for no question. Europe is just the most terrible, yeah, terrible um, zone uh, confederation. And, and there are regularly every Olympics one or two or even three teams that would probably be in the top 10 in the world who don't qualify because there aren't enough spots uh, available to that, uh, to that mm. confederation. So, mm. so, you know, lots of things like that. I, I think, um, I think in many respects, um, and it's not really fair and balanced, but Brazil and the United States have some advantages because mm -hmm. we've been pretty dominant in our confederation. Um, and uh, honestly, I hope that Cuba continues to, to improve and get back to the level that they were in the early mid seventies, both men and women, because it makes, mm -hmm. it makes us better. It makes the team in Canada better. It makes the team in Puerto Rico better. It makes Mexico better. We need, we need that competition uh, so that we don't have to travel to Europe all the time or Asia or wherever. <laughs> um, and, and you want that balance. You'd like, Ideally, if you're running the uh, FIVB, you'd like some balance so that the South American Confederation, the Asian, the, the African, Europe, North Norseca are all more closer than they are today. Uh, so that it, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a sort of a more level playing field. What are some of the things that you did while at USA Volleyball um, in order to improve um, not you know early development you know long term development um and just the development of the of of the high performance level type you know like what are some of the sure. things that you emphasize and where do you think that we can be heading in order to for USA to continue to improve yeah boy lots of things that i'm i'm uh, that stand out to me that i'm pretty proud of during the years i was uh, ceo at volleyball um, we prioritize the youth and junior teams, uh, mm -hmm. men and women. Uh, we created uh, a beach department that had never existed and supported and grew the support for the beach athletes at a significant level. And I think that's um, it's shown because no country other than Brazil competes with the United States on all the platforms. So we wanted to be good at the senior level, men and women indoor, men and women beach, sitting volleyball with uh, mm -hmm. our Paralympic teams. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we're incredibly proud of the women's team that's been a gold medal team uh, on the sitting volleyball side. Um, mm -hmm. We wanted to be good with our youth and junior teams and we've won world championships now with uh, some women at the youth and junior level. Um, so not throwing all of our resources to one discipline or another, which most of the countries in the world do, was never a goal for me. I wanted to be across the board and develop the sport. Um, mm. So we were able to expand the qualifier program to give junior clubs more of an opportunity to play. We expanded the tryout program so that more kids got to experience uh, the opportunity to test themselves and be evaluated relative to how are you going to be the best you can be and, and aspire maybe to a national team level. Uh, our national, our camps in the summer, uh, we expanded. Um, the coaching education program, uh, I, I think, is, is a wonderful program. I, I believe mm -hmm. strongly that the national uh, governing bodies ought to be in the business of certifying or accrediting coaches. I, I think lots of organizations should should educate coaches, should train coaches. And certainly we do that as, at USA Volleyball too, but, but nobody else really has the credibility and authority to certify and say, these coaches are at the top of, of the, the world and, 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 and they've achieved and shown and demonstrated uh, competencies. And so I think that's really important. Um, Doug, um, 
question. I, I want to ask you about two specific subjects. Uh, one is sitting volleyball, um, yeah. and the other <clears throat> is minorities um, in you know in 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 USA. And then, so number one, sitting volleyball. Um, what are some keys that we can learn to grow that game um, around the world? And and do you see this being uh, a college sport? You know, how, how can we contribute as coaches in the you know in the younger ages? for this sport to continue to grow and provide more opportunities to more people? You know, I think, I think you've just hit on the most important thing. The, one of the most critical missions of a national governing body is to create opportunities and offer opportunities to participate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we're not really meeting that objective if we're not engaging with, uh, people with disabilities. And, mm -hmm. and so sitting volleyball certainly is driven by how our teams compete in the Paralympics and move toward qualifying and hopefully earning medals at the world level. Mm -hmm. but, but sitting volleyball can be uh, uh, just a fantastic game recreationally for adults, young people, and My understanding is it's continued to grow as a part of our adult national championships and mm -hmm. is a featured part at a whole bunch of the qualifiers, the junior qualifiers. So I'm, I'm delighted, number one, that USA Volleyball, while I was there, formally became the national governing body for the Paralympic side of our sport. And mm -hmm. we continue to push the, the, the standing disabled uh, version the sand version of, uh, uh, of, of disabled volleyball or Paralympics. And I think, mm. uh, I think it's an important initiative and it meets the broad mission of Olympic, the Olympic world, Olympism, uh, and, mm. and opportunities for, for people. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to go to the, uh, the second part of your question. I think mm -hmm. when I was there, that this may be the most, Um, gnawing limitation of volleyball in this country. Um, we need to do a much, much better job um, of diversifying uh, the participant pool uh, who has access to volleyball. So I'm delighted to be engaged with Starlings, which I think is doing a terrific job. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need a lot more. And um, that's one of the things I, I, I really do regret and I, and I wish we had spent more money and more staff time to reach out and to try to push the regions uh, and push the junior clubs to, and to motivate them because mandating things is, uh, is generally a, a difficult way to create change. It's but negative. It's, yeah, yeah. But yeah. motivating can be done and creating opportunities You know, if you'll go out at the grassroots level and work with kids in disadvantaged areas of the cities and dif disadvantaged populations, and um, you know, the, there there are tons of opportunities out there for us to change It, the demographic. Do you feel nature. that? Do you feel that the financial part of playing club has a has to do with with this matter? Like, because it's it's unattainable. To actually participate, by the way, credit to USA Volleyball and Off the Block that created a documentary. Everyone should watch it on yep. the men's side. That also touches on this subject. But you know what? Is is the social class part of this matter? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, okay, I think it. I think it's a little more complicated than that, Manolo. I think that. Okay. Um, but yes. You know, you know, uh, dollars and cents absolutely play a role. No, no question. Mm -hmm. the The bigger picture for me is that sport right now, um, fortunately and unfortunately, because it's kind of a mixed bag, has been moving for years out of the educational uh, environment and into a private club kind of structure. <laughs> yes, and so so and true. It, Yeah, and it's not just volleyball, obviously. It's Everything. almost yeah. yeah, almost all the sports, with the exception mm -hmm. of football and basketball in this country. Hmm. Uh, and there is some of that in basketball particularly, and a little bit in football 
at a very young age. But football is still really embedded in the educational environment. And so mm -hmm. no matter what the, you know, the mix of, of populations and, and uh, personalities, whatever that, that exists at a school, they're going to have a football program. And so mm -hmm. the demographic profile is going to be broad and it, it's, it, it, you know, the opportunities are available to almost everybody mm -hmm. because it's at school. Hmm. The sports that are primarily in a private club environment are really um, sort of monochromatic. You know, they're very uh, one-dimensional, and there, there's some change. It's a you know a little bit. So it's that plus the the, the dollars and cents, the cost of, of of making this happen, and it's it's really unfortunate. Um, and and what. When I say it's sort of a, a two-edged sword, mm -hmm. U USA Volleyball and most of the national governing bodies survive significantly on revenue from membership and the clubs that support the competitions. Mm -hmm. That's probably, yeah. for USA Volleyball, that's probably 60% uh, of their uh, revenue, maybe, wow. maybe more. <laughs> for some, wow. of the, some of the sports, it might be 80 or 90 percent of their revenue. And that's why they're mm -hmm. suffering right now, because all the competitions are canceled. So membership has uh, slowed up and stopped. So they're all financially uh, in terrible way, including USA Volleyball, which uh, and, and it wouldn't be any different if I was there or anybody else that we, we'd be dealing with exactly the same situation. Let's, so, um I want to explore um, the, by the way, just a second, um, I, I, I want to explain something for the Spanish speakers watching, para los que están hablando, para los que hablan español y están viéndonos, recuerden que tienen la oportunidad de traducir este programa en YouTube. Ahora mismo se está transmitiendo de manera live y recuerden que pueden traducirlo en cualquier idioma, provee subtítulos, eh, ya sea durante la entrevista o después de la entrevista, YouTube tiene ese feature. Obviamente estamos hablando inglés porque estamos hablando con el señor Doc Bill, que es de los Estados Unidos y es el mejor idioma para él. Um, uh, going back to, uh, to the game, I want to ask you, what are, you know, what are some important things that from the motor development that we should consider um, now in, you know, in, in, when working with the youth and junior levels, like what are some things that you feel that we're not paying enough attention and what are some things that we're doing right? Well, first of all, I think we're doing a lot of things right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the, the general level of play um, continues, I think, in this country to go up and up and up uh, because of numbers, quality coaching, good environment, competition, all, all the things that that you would expect that would impact uh, performance. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that I think are unfortunate, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'd like to see us um, move back toward um, an environment where the, the kids aren't um, so focused on, I'm playing at this junior club. I have to be concerned about the position I'm in because it's going to impact my ability to be <laughs> recruited at, at age 14 or 15 or True. maybe 11 or 12. Yeah. And so if I don't grow really early, I'm probably going to be a Libro or a setter. If I grow soon, I might be a middle or a right side or whatever it is. Um, and so there are countries around the world who are, doing a, a better job than we are, I think, of training mm -hmm. the volleyball player, not the outside hitter, not the, uh, you know, back row uh, DS, not the middle blocker. They're training the player. And so maybe some of the skills that you, you see exhibited on their national team by the entire team might be better in some ball control ways, or I don't know, uh, you know, they might, they might develop a better volleyball IQ at an earlier age, something like that. What are some But, of those countries? Yeah, I think Brazil does a, a pretty good job of that. I, frankly, I think Canada does a pretty good job of that. What, what I think mm -hmm. we do so well is we have such big numbers <laughs> uh, and we have such <clears throat> a big pool, huge pool and such a structure of, of competition 
and competition is just just a wonderful tool that um, constantly pushes people to want to be better, to want to achieve, to spend more time, to focus, to see what's going on on this side of the net. How do I get better at doing that? And uh, you know, if you took all the coaches and took them out of the, out of the picture entirely and just said, "Here, here's some volleyballs, go <laughs> play. play, figure it out." Yeah, I'll show you a little film maybe, or you can watch some some high level game. Which is happening with, you know, that's why mm -hmm. football slash soccer is so famous because and sure. around the world because uh, kids just pick up a ball and and become ballers <laughs> before right. anyone, um, right. you know, any of us coaches interrupt that development process. And there's there's some mechanical parts to the game, I think, that uh, make it a little bit easier to pick up at a much, much earlier age. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you. There's. The, the the part that you're talking about the modeling uh just viewing high level play uh is a wonderful tool and uh, you know i tell coaches all the time and mostly they, they know this better than i you, you we shouldn't spend nearly as much time watching what the other team is doing in scouting or match preparation we're going to spend a lot more time watching what we're doing and if you want kids to be better you know they have to see themselves play and and that's a big tool to uh to creating uh improvement i think but we're You know, Manolo, we're doing a lot of things right in this country, um, and oh, yeah. sometimes, sometimes we're we're not doing it because of any specific plan we have, but just the environment. You know, coaching in the United States in, in almost any sport is not the most structured um, educational environment. Uh, there aren't too many places around the uh, country where you can go to a college as an undergraduate and major in coaching. There, there no. are a few, but not very many. Uh, not as many as internationally. Oh, uh, all over, all over the rest of the world, they do that, and yeah. and so we've developed uh, sort of this competitive environment. You want to stay as a coach, you better learn how to organize, uh, how to coach, how to plan practices, how to recruit. You have to learn all those things, and and be successful, and and whatever it is that will allow you to be successful, you have to become good at. And it doesn't take very long for most of the people to, to figure that out and to become very good at those things. And uh, and part of it is I have to deal with the parents, I have to deal with the athletic director, maybe I have to fundraise, oh, yeah. I have to hire the right <laughs> staff, whatever your environment is uh, at the high school, club, uh, university level or or hopefully the professional. No, the operational the part is something that, yeah. that is really different from other places around the world. And I think that it, that's yeah. makes it challenging, but also an opportunity uh, to grow. You know, it, you grow through, you know, while doing it, yeah. uh, like I, like it's supposed to happen, Absolutely. by the way, as long as we get the opportunities to do so. Um, question, uh, just a, a couple of coaching questions that I want to ask you and probably, you know, some people want to uh, wonder about it. Um, In terms of how many drills do you have in a season usually? Uh, at five, ten? I don't know. I don't see you having more than ten drills in a whole season, Doc. Uh, yeah, very few. I, I'm not sure I know what the number would be, but it wouldn't be very many. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you can you can have uh, two or three drills and all the variations, and you can pretty much uh, fill up your time and and your filling it up in, in a really positive way. So, you know, once in a while I would come across something that I thought was, boy, we should be doing some of that. That looks like it's really uh, a smart use of time. And it's, it's exactly the environment that, that we want that player to perform in. But most of the time, yeah, very few drills. Uh, so five or 10 or 12 or who knows what. And yeah, very, very few. Yeah. So I agree. In a timeout, how does a dog build timeout used to look like? Um, yeah. What should we learn from? Yeah, a um, couple of things. Uh, I want the, the team to, uh, well, times out, timeouts are very different if, if I'm calling them because we're struggling or the other team's calling them and I, I don't have any control over that. So we're probably playing pretty well and maybe in the lead. Um, I want the team to have catch their breath, relax, get some water, do that stuff. I might talk to one or two players. I, I very much like um, 
this coach talked to a player, the other coach talked to one or two players. I might talk to one or two players. Um, I think the ability to get everybody together, uh, all six players, maybe seven players, and have them all pay attention and hear what you're saying doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it usually surprises me when I see, uh, I don't know, a football coach with 20 players around him and you know, maybe maybe you can you know yell loud and and get people to <laughs> I don't know hear hear a couple of your words. But so I think I, I think you just remind people about why you're winning and what you have to do to uh, to change the most recent play. So we're going to go out and do this. This is the uh, the play we want to run. This may be the individual we want to set. This is how we want to block one one thing, maybe two things. That's really all you're talking about. Pre-game, uh, um, long conversations, short conversations. Do you even have a meeting the day of the game? Um, what What do you do? Yeah, I think the pre-game, most of the stuff is probably done at the hotel or at your school before the the, the imminent pre-game. Um, I think that um, you've already seen video or you've distributed your scouting. You've talked about your report and. Uh, again, I, I think it should be much more about how you're going to play versus what you think the other team is going to do. Um, but yeah, I, I like having a little bit of a refresher uh, before the team goes out to warm up. You know, in today's world at the NCAA level, at least uh, the the warm up and the the whole time between before the match starts is sort of orchestrated, and it, it's almost like a dance. Um, <laughs> It one is team, one team is on for a few zero minutes. Pass, the other, zero pass. Yeah, and you go back it doesn't make forth. sense, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's no. almost uh, you know, I, I think there are very few spectators who come to the game to watch the warm up. I think uh, <laughs> if we could do it in some other area, bring the team on and they start to play, I'd be a lot happier in, in most sports, I think. Uh, so absolutely. Um, post game, do we talk to the team or no? Yeah, I think sometimes you want to say a few things uh, to the team. I, I think you want to uh, go over, you know, we played well, maybe we lost. Here are some things we did, did well. I don't think it's a long time. Um, you know, it depends on how important this match was, if it was in a playoffs or something. Sometimes you just like your team to absorb the environment. Geez, we just want a big match up against our rival. Stay out on the court. Let the Let the people know that you – you really enjoyed this and this was a big deal for you. And, you know, we played well and it's at the, near the end of the season, something like that. But most of the time, I think um, you, you, you just bring them in, into the locker room. You get off the uh, court, say a couple of things. Here's, here's where we are in the season. This was good. And single out maybe a couple of kids who really had a nice game and, uh, and then let them go out and be with their friends and their family. You know, I think, I think we forget that, um, Gosh, if we're coaching club or if we're coaching high school or college, they're young kids. They're, they're young people. And um, you, you, as much as anything, want them to really enjoy playing this game. If they're mm -hmm. having fun playing, if they, gosh, if they like showing up to practice, which never happens all the time, <laughs> uh, but if they like it most of the time, um, I think you cut practices short, you know, you know if – if you're really doing, uh, things are going well, geez, cut it shorter than the players might think that it was going to be so that they're, mm. ah, I wish I, I, I wanted to play a little more today. I want, I wanted to play <laughs> two hours and 20 minutes instead of one hour and 45 minutes. And so, yeah, you know, more is less, more is less. What player or players have challenged you the most? Name me one or a few <laughs> that you say, man, these guys oh, challenged me the most to be the best version of myself in a good way. Oh uh, gosh. Uh, I've, I've, I've coached so many people. Um, you know, some of the players I coached in Italy, a couple of years I was there were pretty challenging, partly mm -hmm. of course, because of language um, mm -hmm. and just understanding how they grew up uh, learning the game and the culture that was different. Uh, and I had to adapt um, probably more than they did. Um, uh, you know, there were times when the, the U S team I coached wasn't very good. Um, I think for me, the toughest experience in coaching 
was in Sydney in the Olympics. Um, I'm sure that I overcoached that team, and I think it was a really talented team, and we didn't win a match. Uh, so I've, you know, I, I've experienced some pretty highs and some pretty lows too. I, I think I know that world from both ends. Um, and, and you know, you just have to be, I think, really good at two things to coach. You have to be a very, very good listener and you have to know yourself really well. And when mm -hmm. you make a mistake or you aren't sensitive to the team or an individual, you have to call yourself out and mm -hmm. you have to be able to do that. Uh, to be so you told them, coach. you told them coach after Sydney, do you talk to them and say, Hey guys, I think I got in the middle. I got in the way of our success or like yeah, what, what kind of almost all of them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I don't know that I did it group, a group there. I mean, we were mm -hmm. pretty frustrated and we had some injuries going into that tournament, but boy, we had a bunch during the tournament and we, I, I can't, I don't think we played one good match at that tournament and we were playing mm -hmm. a month before that tournament Mm -hmm. uh, I thought maybe, hey, this is a team that could win a medal. So mm -hmm. that's that was really, really disappointing for me. Hardest feedback that Dr. Car McGowan ever gave gave you. If anyone <laughs> knows Car McGowan, oh, uh, he he will tell you things straight up. Yeah. <laughs> so what what was the hardest feedback that you that you got from him at some point? Uh, gosh, there there were plenty. Um, <laughs> there were plenty, uh, but he, he sure told me some wonderful things too. Gosh, I remember oh, yeah. a time he, he just asked me, you know, I, I was a player, not a coach. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he said, you know, are, are, do you really want to play at this level? I mean, are, are, <laughs> do you think you should be playing at this level? Because I don't see that. Said, I, I don't see that you, I don't know, work hard enough or you're confident enough in yourself or whatever. <laughs> Oh man! Yeah. Hey, Doug, you you seem pretty chill, pretty relaxed. Um, is is that also your way to motivate players to interact with your players? Like, tell me how that personality you know you adapted into your relationship skills with your players. Uh, no, I don't think you'd find too many players that would say that about me. Um, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, intense. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, pretty intense. I, I, uh, I, I, I don't like to waste time, and I, uh, I want players to know that the most important contact they're ever going to make is the one coming up, mm -hmm. the next contact, mm -hmm. and so you want to prepare for it. You want to focus on it. You want it to be the best you can do at that time, and when it's over, that's the most unimportant contact. And it has mm. you know, no relevance. You've got to somehow, you know, forget about it, let it go on. I mean, you want to know if you did something wrong, but you have to do it really fast. That's one of the interesting things about sports broadly and certainly volleyball. And so, your ex oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. With your extensive experience as a as a CEO of USA Volleyball and now, you know, with surfing, um, what are some things, advice that you have for other, maybe other federations, like with less financial means? Uh, yeah. For example, my island of Puerto Rico, um, how can we maximize or continue to try to maximize what we have, uh, Doug, you know, from your perspective as an, as an opponent? Yeah, I think you... You have to plan. You have to put a, a, a really well thought out plan together. Uh, and I think you do that with whoever your staff is, but also some uh, objective outside people who maybe were maybe on your board of directors or maybe um, other good coaches or whatever. But not a, you know, it's not a group of 100 people. It's probably six or seven, whatever it is. But you have to put a plan together. That is at least a three or four year plan. Hmm. And, and you have to, you know, where do we want to be in three or four years? And we have to try to be as specific. And then we have to come back from that plan. So we want to get to here. You know, we want to get to here. And right now we're here. You know, and mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we go from here? And we keep going back to today. And part of the plan is 
we can't do everything. So what can we be good at? What does our sport in our country um, allow us to be good at? What kind of resources do we have today? What are the possibilities for resources? You know, where, is, where does our sport rank in the hierarchy, et cetera? And we, we mm. can't do everything, but we want to keep moving in it. We want to create this trajectory <clears throat> that's going up, that's achieving, you know, I don't know, more, more membership, more events, more success, more revenue, more, you know, something. We have to keep doing that. And gosh, we used to use the term more, more, more with our uh, high performance program, our junior youth teams when I was at USA Volleyball. So we want more kids involved. We want more opportunities for them to play and we want more success. We <laughs> want more, 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 but it's, it's gradual and it's not going to happen tomorrow and it's not going to happen all in one year. And, and so you, you know, the trajectory that you're on, the path that you're on has to, has to, can't be like this. You know, we talk now in the pandemic, we're flattening the curve. I don't want, I don't want a flat curve now. I want a, <laughs> an, up, an upward curve. I think, Before, I think planning is really, um, really the, the big deal. It's, it's important. Yeah. Having a really well thought out strategic plan is pretty critical. Advice for us coaches, how to get better at learning. You did that so much for so long in the sport that we all love. Um, what are some of the big keys in order to do the, to do so? Yeah. Create a group around you. That's a mentoring group for you. Uh, that are willing to interact with you on some regular basis. You need to be coached just like your players need to be coached. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you're giving them feedback. You need feedback. You need people to come into your gym to evaluate your communication skills, your interaction, your feedback to players, the rhythm of your practice, the intensity of your practice, uh, all, all of the components that go into making um, – The, the, the training session as optimal as possible. Um, and then, you know, listen, boy, be a, be a good listener. Uh, go, to, go to clinics. But it isn't the formal presentations at clinics, I think, that are the most uh, valuable. It's the social time over the meals, yes. you know, in the dorms, wherever you're staying overnight for a day or two. And you're creating a network that makes you – better. And, and I think that works in every field, whether you're a <laughs> nuclear scientist or a surgeon or, or a coach. Um, I, I think those are, those are pretty valuable tools that, that coaches need to have. I know how I'm going to continue to remember you in the game that we love, but how do you want to be remembered, Doug? <laughs> Oh, uh, that's a tough one, Manolo. Because um, for me, I'm going to remember you always as someone that inspired me to continue to get better at learning. Um, so how, how do you want people to, to remember you? Yeah, um, I was a lucky guy. Uh, I just, the, the experiences that I've been able to have in this sport have been um, just fantastic. And, and I was in the right place at some right times. And I surrounded myself, I think, with some pretty good people. And uh, a great group of athletes came along at the right time for me to coach. And, um, <clears throat> and I don't know, I was passionate about uh, the sport. And, and I'm still passionate about the sport. I think there's lots, lots of growth still out there. And uh, I, I think volleyball is positioned right now Uh, when, once we come out of this pandemic, which has just been devastating for so much of our world. Um, but I think volleyball is has never been in a stronger position, uh, certainly in the United States, but I think really around the world. Um, so I'm excited to have played a role in, in maybe making the sport go to that level. And, and, I, and I'm hoping to continue to, to play a role at some level. So there you the go. last question. <laughs> Last question I have is, yeah. tell me what have you learned from surfing now that I should be knowing? <laughs> tell me, what do yeah. we, what should we know about surfing now that you are the chair of the board of USA Surfing? Yeah, the, the passion people have for the sport that they grow up with is, um, is a common 
uh, issue across the world. I thought you were going to talk about golfing there for a minute. <laughs> uh, nice hat, though. I like that. Um, it's a Puerto Rican yeah, hat. <laughs> yeah, it's a beauty. Uh, gosh, I have some wonderful memories of playing in Puerto Rico, I'll tell you. Um, you know, uh, the the athletes that I've had an opportunity to, uh, to talk with uh, over electronic means only um, really impressed me with their commitment to the sport and their uh, love of just being out in the water and and challenging themselves to be better i think that's a common theme uh, uh, you know athletes are are special at, at a, especially at, at the highest level and there's so many commonalities from beach volleyball players to uh field hockey players to archers to to surfers it's um there's a lot of commonality and the passion and the, uh, you know, the willingness to, to push yourself to, to be the best you can be. We, we, we've got this term that we're using today. I think the best version of myself, <laughs> I, I like that <laughs> term, you know, because it's it. op optimizing uh, whatever abilities, talents, growth that I can uh, muster in myself. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated always by that process. Now you have to tell me what uh, memory that you have from Puerto Rico. You know, you got me. You got me uh, curious about it. Yeah, the 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 Olympic qualifier in uh, 2003 to yes, go sir. to the uh, <clears throat> to go to the Athens. Uh, yeah, the Athens Olympics. I, I don't did. remember it the way you do. I don't remember it the way you do. It hurt. It really hurt. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we have different memories. Um, <laughs> But I, I had had my knee operated on, uh, yeah. I don't know, a couple of weeks before, and it was still swelling up uh, every day. And, you know, and every match, um, I, you know, I was standing up. Uh, by the end of the match, I couldn't get my pants off because the, the knee was so swollen. Wow. And we were uh, down, I think, two to one to Cuba in the final match and uh, it went to a fifth set, and it was – our players really, really performed under some pretty uh, challenging pressure, I think, to qualify for that uh, for that Olympics and had a pretty good tournament in uh, Athens. I remember that tournament pretty well. But Puerto Rico has been a great place to play. Great crowds. The sport is popular. Um, you know, I, I hope coming out of the pandemic that the leagues can recover in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think that's a, a really important um uh, element for this for the sport in the in the north seca world uh and we need to get leagues in this country um maybe with canada but i think mm -hmm. that's important so yeah i have i have really very very positive feelings about uh, puerto rico uh, from volleyball and thank lots you. of great people uh there so thank you so much for for that for those words i think that everyone in puerto rico um understands the importance of of what you have had in the in the game um you know when i said about the you know 2003 olympic qualifiers of course they were in our island and uh, you know yeah definitely it was uh yeah. it was a nail biter um you know something that i will never forget i was telling uh doc bill before the interview that that was the time that i met dr car mcgown um, you know, sitting, uh, scouting a match and, uh, you know, approach him. And that's how I got really interested into motor learning in volleyball. So, um, you know, yeah. I want to thank you uh, for everything that you have done for the game, Doug, and uh, that you continue to do for the sport uh, itself. So um, I appreciate the time uh, and the opportunity of talking to you today. It has been a great learning opportunity. Thanks, Manolo. This is great. I, and I, I, I really am uh, proud to be a part of this. And uh, uh, I think what you're doing is, uh, is really important now. And, and, and you should continue it when, uh, when the world becomes a, a safer place for events start to happen again. But because this, is, uh, this is terrific. And, and lots of wonderful, wonderful people that uh, are, are so important to our sport that you've interviewed. So that's great. Thanks again, Doug Beal, um, one of the legends of the sport of volleyball, not just in the U.S., but around the world, um, and now with USA Surfing. Uh, <laughs> please stay safe. Uh, you're in Colorado right now, right? I am, Colorado Springs, yeah.
Okay. All right. Yeah. So please stay safe and healthy. Um, yeah. For everyone watching, remember that you can see uh, this interview and many others uh, in our YouTube channel that is called Bolly Junkies as well. Uh, also on the Facebook page called Bolly Junkies. Tomorrow we have the last interview of the first season of <laughs> what this became, whatever it mm. is. Um, so tomorrow we're going to have Coach Fisher, Dan Fisher from Pitt. Uh, who is also involved with USA Volleyball. So wow. I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Um, after tomorrow, I'm going to take a little break and then, um, you know, try to get back uh, stronger than ever and try to help continue grow the game. And for everyone out there watching, please do the same. Please uh, be a master learner like Mr. Doug Beal has taught us today and has always done. Thanks. So thank Bye. you, everyone. And I'll see you mañana. Ciao.